Hi there, hope you're having a lovely day so far. Well, 2020 will undoubtedly be a year that we will never forget. You know, starting with our devastating bushfires, drought, climate disruption, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, on a positive note, in recent weeks, we've seen the inarguably encouraging effects that social isolation has brought our planet with animals returning to their natural habitat and reduced pollution in major cities. It's almost like Mother Earth, or Gaia, as she's also known, is being allowed to heal, rejuvenate, and just breathe a sigh of relief for the first time in thousands of years. Now, each of these events should be teaching us something. And when we learn as adults, it's our responsibility to teach lessons to our children to ensure that history just doesn't repeat itself. You know, children naturally have a strong connection with our natural world and it's our role to, to protect our planet for the sake of our children, for their children's children, and just for generations to come. So to talk to us about this today is our special guest, Sally Gillespie. <laughs> Sorry. Now, Sally is a writer and a lecturer in the fields of eco-psychology and climate psychology. Now, Sally gained her PhD at the Western Sydney University, researching psychological experience of engaging with climate issues. Now, Sally then wrote her book, Climate Crisis and Consciousness, Reimagining Our World and Ourselves, uh, to make what she learned accessible to the general public. Now, thank you so much for joining us today, Sally. How are you? I'm well today. Thank you, Rachel, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank very, you. very grateful for your time. And um, there's really lots to talk about on this topic. Now, to begin with, isn't it so interesting that leading up to the coronavirus pandemic, that there was such media hype uh, in the media about climate change and every other conversation um, on TV and the radio was really sort of based on or around it. But since then, it's really hardly been anything mentioned. I'd love to know initially, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think it's understandable that we only focus on one crisis at the time. However, the reality is in, in an ecological world, crises are not separated. So what we've come to understand about this virus and many other viruses transmitted from animal to human is that they do come out of ecological disruption. Uh, in this case, uh, wild uh, Rainforests are destroyed. It drives animals out of the rainforest like bats. They become sickened and that then gets transmitted on to humans. Uh, so we do need to keep an eye, particularly on what's happening around climate, because, you know, in the natural world, the effects of the warming climate are intensifying. And the fact is that, yes, we've got the COVID virus uh, crisis right now, but that will not stop the other uh, uh, climate-driven uh, effects increasing until we really tackle the, the prime causes of mm -hmm. the climate. I think we will see more in the media as we talk more about economic recovery because we have this tremendous opportunity here and big choices to make about how we do build the economy up and this is a great opportunity to get behind renewable energies, sustainable industries and regenerative agriculture, all of which will help to reduce carbon emissions in the atmosphere. And I think it's really important for people to be able to see the connection between climate change and the pandemic. Um, do you think a lot of people have connected those dots yet or not at all? No, because there's just still research going on. How, uh, however, it seems pretty clear now that this virus did come from uh, from sick bat colonies, and uh, the bats are struggling a lot uh, within uh, natural habitats because of so much has been destroyed. But the, another big source of pandemics and viruses, of course, is from factory farming. And the kind of, again, the animals sicken when they're crowded together, when they're fed a lot of uh, antibiotics or different kinds of drugs. Um, and also we, will, we are seeing more anthrax come from the Northern Hemisphere due to permafrost melting. And that, as that happens, the corpses of reindeer with anthrax get uncovered and the anthrax 
can jump over to human populations. So there's a lot of reasons why the climate crisis can drive pandemics, as well as have all sorts of other really uh, bad health effects. Mm. And you're known to have been supportive and encouraging both in relation to learning how to navigate the emotional ups and downs of climate change awareness, as well as developing a greater attunement with our natural world. So I'd love to know what are your thoughts on what the world is going through at the moment, specifically about the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, there's many lessons. I think one of the things that comes across is it's reminding us we're biological beings, you know, that our lives are dependent on our health and our health is dependent on clean air, clean water, uh, good sanitation, you know, the right things we need to support good health. Um, so I think that brings us back to the basics and it brings us back to really questioning what the values are in life. Uh, I think both with the bushfire crisis and with COVID, we've had to think a lot about where our food comes from and what, what supports food security. It's interesting that the nurseries are all sold out of their seeds and their seedlings. So, mm. you know, it, it's bringing us back to the basics of what supports a good life. And I think that's very helpful given that the climate crisis is driven by very high consumption, often of goods that really are not necessary to a good life. Yes, I love that point. It's really making us um, reevaluate our personal values, our beliefs, and bringing us back to, I guess, what is the most important thing in life, so, and things in life. So thank you for that point. Now, we published your article titled, Loving Children, Loving Nature. For someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please give us an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it? Well, I, I wanted to choose this as my first post for Kittypedia because I think it's just so basic. It's, it, it's basic to children's health and happiness. It's basic to all of our health and happiness, how much connection we have with the living world, both in terms of what that gives to us at a, a physical level, at a health level, an emotional, a psychological level, but also how it supports a healthy society and culture. Uh, because as we were talking about before, uh, a good life is based on a healthy environment and a healthy ecosystems. Mm. Um, and there is so much joy of being the natural world. So that's what I wanted to start with. Yeah. And as you beautifully mentioned in your article, children really start life with an affinity uh, for our natural world. And I would love to read a paragraph um, to give some light into further into your perspective. So using your words, young children start life with an affinity for our natural world, instinctively seeking out the company of animals, birds, trees, rocks, shells and places for their special companions and friends, physically experiencing our world through encounters with tadpoles, wind, rock, pools, caves, ants, or autumn leaves, weaves into the larger life of the world. These encounters arouse uh, children's curiosity and feeling of kinship with earth. Now, you mentioned um, also that now more than ever is the time uh, to nurture children's um, connection with a natural world. Could you explain a little bit more about why you think it's so important for children to learn to love and cherish our planet? Well, I think it's a, going to be a major focus of children's lives as they grow up, as we do deal with the effects of various ecological Well, I, I think it's very important for us all to, but certainly for our children, this is going to be the major focus of their lives as uh, growing up as adolescents and as adults, because it is so vital that we do uh, healing and regeneration of the ecosystems that support our lives. And we are at a crisis point with this. But more than that, there is the great joy yeah, that comes in being in the natural world and the outdoor life. And, um, you know, unfortunately, part of the growing urbanisation as well as increasing online life means that children are getting less time outside. And it's, it's not helping children's health and well-being. They, they thrive when they get outside. It helps children's imagination, their creativity, their ability to develop confidence in their physical selves. 
Mm -hmm. um, and also it has a very calming influence and it helps the immune system. So there's many, many benefits and there's many joys as well as there is a great necessity for us to understand more and to come to our life from the sense of a central love for, for ecosystems. Mm, I'd love to read another uh, paragraph from your article. Here we go. So quoting you again. <laughs> Most young children and natural scientists and adventurers happily becoming absorbed in studying the movement of ants or climbing trees. This may look like playtime, but it's also a vital activity for developing and understanding and bonding with nature's processes. When adult carers support nature connectedness uh, by pro providing plenty of unstructured outdoor play and encouraging uh, a child's natural curiosity, they lay the foundations for ongoing care and resourcefulness. Now, can you please tell us why you think it's so important for parents to provide more opportunities for unstructured outdoor play? Uh, because the children won't get that without parents actually providing that that uh, opportunity. And I think that includes both the, the part that's beloved by a child. You know, children have a, develop a very strong sense of place and often a love for a particular tree or a bird that they might always get to see uh, mm. down in that park. And children learn from their parents about what's important. So if they see their parents there with them valuing and being absorbed in what they are absorbed in, um, then it, 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 it communicates to the child that this is, this is both a lovely thing to happen as well as an important focus to, to have in life. And I think there's a tremendous adventure there for parents and children in learning about the natural world together through observation, um, really tuning the senses into what's going on in the natural world, the smells, the sounds, the sights, uh, and then to follow that up through books and through um, wildlife programs and so on. Mm, unstructured outdoor play may be um, challenging for a lot of families, given that in, in a lot of major cities um, with high density living now um, and the ability to be able to get outdoors um, to to parks and natural settings. When here in Melbourne, we are quite lucky because we, you know, people that live close to the city, we, we do have some beautiful um, sort of a city gardens etc but not all cities and all um, people that live in high density areas have that ability. Um, do you have any tips if any at all um, for families that um, want to be able to give their children unstructured outdoor play however don't necessarily have the ability to have access to, to, to enough or the right sort of settings? Look I think it's the matter of making do with what you can have and you know especially with young children they can get very absorbed in one plant and a line of ants coming in and out of that plant. So though there's, you know, it's wonderful to have big space, small space works well too, even if it is just a courtyard or a balcony. It's about letting the child kind of settle down and really get, and getting down with the child and saying, what can we see is going on here? You know, are there any ants around? Or do you, you know, is the bird noticing what we're doing down here? And things like that. Um, but I think it's it's important that we as citizens make very clear to our politicians that we all want access to outdoor areas close close to where we live, uh, and that we want increased tree canopies, which both helps with increasing heat, but also draws in more more birds and more insects, uh, which is all part of what we need to to connect with and to appreciate more. Mm, I've previously worked with a lot of city councils and in particular the city of Melbourne and know it's within their, um, their strategy to be able to ensure um, that they are providing enough um, sort of outdoor space. And I think that is just a, a, um, an important part of it. any um, local government areas strategies to ensure that there's enough outdoor play areas for, for children and families. Yeah. So even if it is a little bit of a walk to the park, uh, it's a matter of finding the, the right areas to, to give children the opportunity for that unstructured outdoor play and like you said before there is some wonderful I mean the amount of information that's available via documentaries and those types of things as well um, even on free to air television with the likes of the BBC's um, David Attenborough's um, series as well there is um, 
unlimited opportunity to be able to give children access and the insights to the things that are most important about <laughs> outdoor life. Um, I'd love to also know, um, you know, from your perspective, how is the COVID-19 virus making us more aware of human-caused ecological destructions um, in our world? Well, I think, yes, we've, we've talked already about how it's brought, bringing to awareness the, the, um, the problems that are caused by habitat destruction, including increased risk of viruses. Mm -hmm. On the more positive side, we've seen a tremendous reduction of uh, air pollution, air pollution particularly, and particulate pollution. People probably have seen those photos of what Delhi looks like now compared to how it looked you know, two months ago and some cities to see blue skies for the first time. And what research is coming out to show people are more vulnerable to COVID-19 in cities where air pollution is typically very high. In other words, there's high use of um, petrol cars, petrol fuel cars particularly. So this is telling us yet again how important it is that we find alternative ways of getting about that are not dependent on petrol because it emits carbon and it uh, emits uh, air particulates, which are very um, detrimental to respiratory health. Uh, so we're, we're, again, this is another part of learning those connections. Um, but it's also, I think, helping us to see, uh, yeah, our environment could really appreciate being more thought of and less used in a way which has no thought for what the consequences of human action is on the habitat and the flora and fauna. Mm. And in your opinion, what can we be doing from home and just within our families on a day-to-day -day basis to help care for our environment um, a little bit more during this time of quarantine? Well, I think it'd be interesting for every family to find out what is to think about the changes they have made. As people seem to be walking and cycling a whole lot more. Mm. And I've, I've seen uh, reports from overseas in Milan have decided to increase the amount of space for pedestrians and cycleways as a result because it creates a better city. So some of this is going, well, actually, perhaps my lifestyle and how I feel is being helped by going slower in some cases or thinking, growing my own food, thinking more about local food and so on, as well as the increased walking, the cycling, and the appreciating of parks. I, I've heard a lot of reports of people saying how much they just appreciate parks now that this is our, our big way of getting out and getting exercise and, and being able to wave to the neighbors and so on. Uh, so that, that appreciation hopefully will continue on. Um, in, in that way. So I think it also is helpful for us to realize that we can make changes. Now, some of the changes to COVID-19 have been very hard and some people are particularly feeling the brunt of that. We're not feeling it in an equal way at all. Um, but if we can understand that we can make changes if we plan for them and look after those who may be worse affected by changes, it does help us understand that we don't have to live as we have been living in a way that is so detrimental to planetary health, which is ultimately detrimental to our health and the health of other species. Mm -hmm. um, and how, in your opinion, how can we keep up the campaign for climate action during this time? Oh, well, I think this is a good time to be sitting down right into your, uh, your state, your Local MPs, your state MPs, your fed, federal MPs, they do listen when they get a letter. And so if there's something you want to advocate for, whether it is cycleways or parks or increased climate action, as I said before, politicians are deciding where are they going to put stimulus money uh, into what industries. And this is the time for us to be pushing that stimulus money goes into renewable energies rather than, say, opening up more coal mines or finishing new, initiating new fracking, which will drive up emissions greatly. And we can see more and more why we might want to go a different way and the potential for developing manufacturing industries here in Australia, which will feed into this kind of change of um, uh, energy production and transmission. Mm. So, uh, yeah, get out there, start advocating, and um, find a campaign. 
Uh, I don't know if your uh, people here are very aware of One Million Women. That's a tremendous uh, organisation, which is dedicated to empowering women to embark on climate action at every level. And it does terrific posts on how, what to do around the home to reduce your carbon footprints and also woman-led initiatives uh, in, in various different spheres. So that's a great one to look for. Or Australian Parents for Climate Mine, making submissions, doing writing letters and so on. And the other thing is have a conversation. Talk to people. Talk to your family. Talk to your friends about how they're feeling, what they're valuing, and how you might get together and, and lobby for increased climate action. Mm, great points. Um, and also in your article, you speak about the fact that children's um, outdoor life has been eroded in recent generations um, through urbanisations. Um, definitely the amount of time we spend online in our digital life now, with screen time um, and education and parenting practices um, all contribute to what, um, and there's an, a wonderful author that you have quoted in your article, um, Richard Louvre. Uh, he's the author of, um, as you mentioned, a groundbreaking book. Uh, the title is The Last Child in the Woods. Um, and he describes... Um, Oh, that, that's it. Wonderful. Hold it up. Wonderful. Uh, as nature deficit disorder caused by decreased outdoor experience and play. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, look, he did wonderful groundbreaking work. It's been around for a little while, this, this book, but it, it's generated a lot more uh, research since then, all of which has backed up the things he was uh, saying. And I think it's particularly, uh, his work is particularly uh, help to stimulate things like bush schools and bush kindergartens. Uh, and, uh, you know, the th thing about having vegetable gardens in schools and so on. So I think teachers know if they can get the, the kids out for these kind of educational um, activities outside, the, the children settle down better when they come back in the classroom. Lou particularly wrote about ADD and ADHD and how much... Uh, research there is to show how, how, how much children who uh, struggle with these kind of issues are helped by having increased time in the outdoor world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that really inerts us to actually we're all the same. You've probably heard of forest bathing. That's become something which has been... No, what's big. that? Oh, it's come out of Japan. It's really the idea, which, I mean, I think a lot of this is common sense, but we have strayed from common sense, that if we go and walk quietly and mindfully in the bush or in a forest, that it, renew, it renews our spirits, it relaxes our nervous system, uh, it helps us to focus and concentrate. So it's, it's kind of the very opposite of the, you know, sitting on the computer screen and just having endless stuff bombarded. <laughs> Like me, yes. <laughs> to us, yeah, <laughs> like all of us. And uh, doubt that we will, our, our, our health, our minds improve from being out in green and that even green itself is a very positive colour for calming and so on. And the, the other thing I think came out of Lou's work too was how healing uh nature is and there's been a lot of research that shows you know if you have a if you're in hospital and you have a window looking at a tree you will get your rates of uh recovery will be higher than those who don't have access to that window or the tree or even a poster of the forest so we're yes. programmed to feel good in the natural world yeah you've given us so much food for thought today if you were to summarize your key points sally for any parent watching what would they be get outside and play with your child, have a wonderful <laughs> time and practice gratitude for all the gifts of our living world. Wonderful. And if parents have got any other questions and or would like to reach out to you, whereabouts can they find you? Oh, you can look at me up in LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, or on Facebook, Sally Gillespie, author, Facebook. Site. Thank you so much for your time. I'm extremely grateful and I can't wait for our next chat. Take care. Thank you. You too, Rachel. Thank you. It's been lovely. Thank you. Bye.